Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's awareness webinar is entitled The Shopper Economy, The New Way to Achieve Marketplace Success by Turning Behavior into Currency. You're going to be hearing from our guest presenter, Liz Crawford. My name is Sal Gilberto. I'm the marketing manager here at Awareness. Wanted to couple of, uh, co uh, cover a couple of items before we get started. One is I'm going to answer the question that many people have on their mind. The answer is yes, we are recording today's webinar. So we get that a lot. We will be recording today's webinar, and we will be emailing you out a recording of the webinar tomorrow. So do feel free to take notes. If you miss anything or you want to share this great resource with anyone else, you will have that opportunity. I also wanted to let everybody know that we are going to make today's session uh, both informative and interactive. We will be taking questions. Questions can be submitted in two ways. They can be submitted in the WebEx chat, or they can be submitted on Twitter at hashtag Awareness Inc. We're going to save questions until the end. So you can submit them throughout, and we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible at the end. So your presenters. Um, our guest speaker is Liz Crawford. Liz Crawford is a consultant, a contributor to a couple of different properties, as you see there, and also the author of The Shopper Economy. So Liz, hi. How are you doing today? Hey there. Good. Great. Welcome aboard. Uh, and you're also hearing from me. That's, uh, that's me, Sal Gilberto. I'm the Marketing Programs Manager here at Awareness. If you need to get in contact with me, there's my email address. You can also contact me on Twitter. Uh, if you are tweeting to the Awareness Inc. Um, uh, handle, chances are I'm the person on the other end who you're speaking with. So look forward to your communications. So again, we are going to be um, interactive in our session. We're going to allow questions. Questions will be saved at the end. Uh, saved until the end. Two ways to submit questions. Uh, one is via the WebEx chat, and one is on Twitter at uh, hashtag Awareness Inc. We also do have WebEx support on the line. So if you do run into any issues, like volume issues or anything like that, just uh, chat into uh, or post your, your issue into the WebEx chat, and um, WebEx support will be able to help you with that. And today's session is based on a book of the same title, The Shopper Economy, The New Way to Achieve Marketplace Success by Turning Behavior into Currency. It's a very interesting read. If you're, uh, you're going to find out a lot about this sort of new economy and the new way of doing business. That is, you know, it's, um, it's sort of a uh, very interesting and exciting space to be in. If you want more information or to order uh, The Shopper Economy, you can go to shoppereconomy.net. You can obviously also go to Amazon.com in order to uh, purchase the book as well. But uh, I thought it was, a, I think it's a very interesting uh, read, so I recommend it to anybody. I want to talk a little bit about what awareness does. You're an awareness webinar. I just want to talk a little bit about what uh, we do. Uh, we are a software company. We make software for marketers. Our flagship product is the Awareness Social Marketing Hub, which is a social media uh, management software solution. I show you to some of our customers here just to show you that we work with businesses of all shapes and sizes. You're going to see some very popular large brands in this slide as well as some, you know, some smaller and medium sized businesses, B2B, B2C agencies that you're seeing on this slide. So we do work with a multitude of brands. We work in the social media space. We talk to uh, you know hundreds of companies a week, and uh, we hear a lot of common social media challenges, people saying that they're overwhelmed with the job of social media that they have a hard time proving the value, that they understand that social media does have value, but they, are ha they, uh, they can't prove uh, the value with data. They have a hard time keeping control. There's so many uh, there's many places in which they have to log in to conduct their social media, different channels, lots of comments coming in and passwords to pass around. And people have a hard time getting strategic. So if you, you feel overwhelmed and you can't prove the value and you don't feel like you have control, it's hard to feel like you're in a strategic mode. You sort of feel like you're in that reactionary tactical phase of marketing. So with those challenges in mind, we created the Awareness Social Marketing Hub, a tool that allows you, allows you to publish, manage, measure, and engage across all of your social media channels. Those channels would be Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, Foursquare, YouTube, SlideShare, WordPress, a couple of others. Um, that are not mentioned on this slide. Um, but basically, it is a uh, tool that allows you to centralize your social media uh, management into one area. It allows you, again, to publish, manage, measure, and engage. And the benefits being you gain control, you centralize all of your programs, and you have a very clear understanding of who's doing what. 
you evolve into a strategic mode, and you can measure your success and make uh, improvement based on data-driven analysis. So if you're interested in a software tool to help manage your social marketing, you can try the Hub for free. Um, you can request a free trial. Uh, there's a link there. I'll share this link at the end of the webinar as well, and you can uh, test drive the Hub free for 14 days. So with that, I will uh, give the presentation over to Liz Crawford. Okay. Um, hi, I am Liz Crawford, and I am just about to share my desktop. So <laughs> let's make sure that, that I've got that going here, and then we will start with the shopper economy. I am the author of The Shopper Economy, and today I'm going to talk about a few of the main ideas behind the book. Um, so what I'm going to start with here is just a statement from Herbert Simon, who is an economist, and uh, what he says is that information, what information consumes is obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. A wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And what's really interesting to me about that is that, um, first of all, there's hardly anyone who isn't experiencing a poverty of attention. So I think that that's you know, something that we can all um, relate to and understand. And we're being bombarded all the time with information and messages and opportunities to communicate. Um, but in many ways, this really is the foundation of the shopper economy um, because... What this means is that attention is scarce. And in an economic sense, scarcity creates value. So therefore, attention is a form of value. And I mean this in a very literal way. So marketers are paying for shoppers' attention. Now, we know that marketers have paid for shoppers' attention since there's been advertising. Uh, however, what I'm suggesting here is that attention is a form of shopper labor, which can be exchanged for a literal wage and that it's a deliberate and opt-in kind of transaction between a potential buyer and a potential seller. So let me talk a little bit about attention as a form of shopper labor. Here on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that there's a couple of um, uh, telecom companies, you know, Virgin Mobile, Telcordia, Lucent. Anyway, these three companies, uh, they all offered a minute a free airtime for every minute that their subscribers spent watching an ad. Um, so this is kind of interesting. You know, it's one of the first of its kind because it, you know, the, the, the smartphone acted like a, like a platform immediately. So subscribers could go, heck yes, give me the, uh, pay me the wage of a free minute of airtime for, uh, in exchange for me paying attention. And the thing that's really neat about that is what I'm talking about here with this kind of transaction is I'm not talking about like a deferred discount. I'm not talking about a sweepstakes like maybe I'll get a chance to win something. I'm talking about really earning something, um, really earning some value. So now I have Facebook up here and I have Zynga up here. And, of course, Zynga has, is the uh, creator of Farmville and Mafia Wars and, you know, all these great um, games and social games. And um, there's an opportunity, well, these guys, you know, have created ads in-game where you can, you know, have the opportunity to opt in, watch an ad, and what you get in exchange is in-game currency that you can spend, you know, in the game or in that environment, or Facebook credits. So that's kind of interesting. In fact, actually last year, uh, AdAge said, now Facebook users can earn credits simply by participating with the advertiser to earn free stuff. And that's true. Um, that's kind of a new thing, enabled, of course, by digital technology. And then these three other you know, little boxes that have popped up um, each feature a platform which has emerged in order to facilitate these kinds of transactions. So on Zoombox and Swagbox and so forth, you can get in there and watch ads and do some other kinds of stuff, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, in exchange for earning digital script. So I can watch an ad and get some Swagbox or, you know, watch an ad on Zoombox and, and get, an, you know, and get Zoombox. And so this is all digital script. Now, um, yeah, let me go to the next one. So if you haven't seen Swagbox, 
I'm sure some of you have. But nevertheless, um, you know, I've done these kinds of screenshots to sort of say, all right, well, what's this experience like? Well, shoppers will go on to Swagbucks or Zoombucks or Varalo, and they'll register themselves. And then they go about um, giving their labor in exchange for digital script. Here, you can watch videos or you can perform a task. Right now, we're... You know, we're looking at attention, so we'll be talking about watching videos. And what they're doing, what these folks are doing is they're earning swag bucks, swag bucks, which you can see on the lower left. Now, the reason I'm really saying this is a wage is because, first of all, they're not actually buying anything. So it's not like a buy-to-get kind of a program. It's a labor to get digital script. And is it a wage? Well, yeah. You can redeem your swag bucks in cash and it will all get deposited into a PayPal account. So in this sense, yeah, it's really currency. Um, and then here's a, here's a shot. So what does this really look like? Well, you can see that uh, if we were all swag buckers, we would have the opportunity to click and watch a preview of Best Friends Forever, which is a, um, a kind of a pilot sitcom. It could also be an ad. In this particular case, is actually laboring to you know, give some kind of feedback on this um, you know, on this particular program. But, you know, here I've earned a swag buck. So that's kind of neat. And of course, you have the opportunity to share and tweet and so forth. Uh, but I've earned a, a buck. So in the traditional marketplace, the transaction looks sort of like this. You've got the buyer on the left, and she's digging around in her purse for fiat currency, that is dollars and cents. And then you've got the seller on the other side who is exchanging that for goods and services. So you've got fiat currency in exchange for goods and services. So we all know that. In the shopper economy, the transaction changes somewhat so that the shopper becomes a worker. And he or she is giving labor to a potential seller who's an employer or who's her employer. So she's actually selling shopper tasks in exchange for digital script. And then here's the, here's the script. I'm going to be calling these value transactions. The shopper economy is a kind of shadow economy. It's a new labor market for shopping tasks where brands and retailers are actually competing for the labor of shoppers. And in the book, I say that shopper currency are behaviors that create units of value which can be redeemed for goods and services. So also in the book, I bucket four main currencies, attention and in terms of behavior, attention, participation, advocacy, and commitment. Commitment in the book I'm also calling loyalty. Uh, I kind of wish I had called it commitment. I think it's more, it gets at what I mean a little bit more, so we're going to talk about that. But nevertheless, you know, human behavior, of course, doesn't fall neatly into four buckets, but they do seem to encompass the four main areas where these kinds of transactions are taking place. Also, in terms of the shopper economy, the shopper economy itself is just kind of a mental way in because I think that it becomes really easy to think um, very tactically and to kind of get lost in the weeds of, well, we're doing this and we're doing this and we're doing this and, you know, what the heck are we doing overall? So what's the big picture here and, and what are we trying to do? And the shopper economy says that shoppers in many cases are thinking in terms of, even if it's sort of sub subconsciously right now, but they're thinking in terms of the value of their labor and the return on their attention or the return on their participation to make it worth their while. So I think that we can think of uh, marketing now in terms of baskets of behaviors and how they're helping us to achieve uh, strategic objectives. Okay, so let's talk about the second bucket, which is participation. Um, this is a pretty roomy bucket. Um, involves all kinds of things. And, and the different um, logos that are on the screen are other kinds of platforms that facilitate participation. Of course, you know, most of you probably know about Shopkick where you download an app onto your smartphone and when you walk into many different retailers and even malls and things, you get points, which are called kick bucks. So there's your digital script there. And again, the shopper is called a shopper because the person hasn't been buying anything. They're just walking into the store and getting the points. They can pick up a, uh, an item off of the shelf and scan it, mind you not buy it, and also get points. <clears throat> Excuse me. And those points are then redeemable um, at many different places, including um, cash discard, um, cash gift cards. Scavenger is more of a gamification kind of a platform. Uh, but nevertheless, what I wanted to do is show one which is called Checkpoints. Now, Checkpoints, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play their little video here because it illustrates some things really well. 
And I'm going to hold this up here. The prize for something you do every day. Now you can with Checkpoints. Checkpoints is a mobile app that lets you earn cool prizes like gift cards, airline miles, and gadgets just for checking out your favorite products and places. Each time you check in, you get points towards rewards called Checkpoints. Say you're going shopping. You grab your phone and fire up Checkpoints. Checkpoints shows you how many points are available nearby. You check in at the grocery store. 20 points. <laughs> so you check into the grocery store, you get 20 points. I mean, it's it's just like that, and you pick up a you pick up a uh, an item, and you get more points. So what you're accumulating there, just by walking down the aisle, are different kinds of points, and that's true for all of these things. And scavenger, scavenger is also kind of interesting because it's real a real gamification um, kind of a platform where people are more on kind of a treasure hunt. So the motive there is you know slightly different. Um, and here you can see that the you know this is the scavenger. So you can go and do different kinds of challenges. Here they have points, and then they have challenges done. That's a bit different from Shopkick and Checkpoints. The challenges include things like, oh well, can you make an origami um, crane out of some of the wax paper that you get at the donut shop? You know, something like that. Um, so these are the kinds of games that you're going to be playing, or that these people are playing. And this tends to be very good for things like local retailers. Um, also, when it comes to participation, you can see that the platform, which is called We Reward, um, you can see the direct cash out there. So you've got a point balance of 715 will equal $7.15. You can cash out via PayPal. So this is really interesting because this really demonstrates that it is um, labor for a wage. Also, with Shopkick, you can redeem it so many different places. And here they do have gift cards and so forth. And you can also get discounts, if you like, off of um, merchandise at different stores, different retailers. Or you can donate all of it into charity. Now, those were some platforms. You can also work directly, or companies can work directly with um, shoppers to solicit participation by offering them digital scripts. For example, link your Starwood and Foursquare accounts to earn bonus Starwood points. So, you know, there's an opportunity to exchange behavior for script. In fact, I just was staying at um, a Weston, which is a Starwood um, property um, in Chicago uh, during this past week. And the first thing that, I, that they did, as soon as I walked in, at the desk, they said, would you like to forego housekeeping for a night? And in exchange, you can either get $5 to spend anywhere in the hotel, or we can give you 250 bonus star points on your account. So there it is. So there they're soliciting me to, you know, exhibit a certain kind of behavior, and in exchange for that, um, you know, I get a, a kind of a reward, which I can then bank. Now, this little square that I have down here is um, from Swagbucks, and I liked it because it showed other kinds of ways of using shopper labor. So this one says, can you make a purchase or a financial tra transaction on this website? And then there's the website, and it says yes or no. The thing that's kind of neat about that is they're recruiting people to kind of say, hey, how do you like our website? Is it making sense? Can you make a financial transaction here? You know, yes or no. And so we'll pay you a little bit in order to get this kind of answer. So that's kind of neat. Um, the next bucket, of course, is advocacy, and I'm sure that everybody on the line, because of you know the nature of awareness and so forth, um, is you know I'm sure that you all are experts on advocacy and earned media and so forth. Um, but advocating a brand um, or getting a friend to buy is really uh, sort of the final frontier here with digital media. So. For American Express, earn 5,000 points for every friend you refer. Groupon, you can re you can get 10 Groupon dollars. Or what I really like about Groupon is you can say, hey, I really want that thing, you know, that deal, whatever it is. And if you want to get it, quote, unquote, for free, if you recruit three people to buy that, you get yours for free. I think that's really neat and a real nice example of, you know, behavior for um, for value. Now, this is a real literal kind of platform that says pay with a tweet. You can sell your products for the price of a tweet. So you can really use your social network here to actually um, you know, exchange that advocacy for value. The last bucket is commitment or loyalty. 
Um, in terms of shopper currency, loyalty in terms of behavior is a commitment to buy a brand in the future. It's the promise of a probable value stream. So shoppers really know that this future revenue stream does have value, and they're looking to optimize the return on their commitment or their loyalty. So when I was at the um, at this conference this past week, some people were staying at the Marriott. Why? Because they were already committed, and they wanted the return on their commitment to be at the fullest because they wanted those points. We see this behavior, of course, all the all the time. And then here are a bunch of them. We've got credit cards and so forth. Even something like a stop and shop. This is not the only one, but it was a good example. You know, if I stop at if I shop at stop and shop. I get so many points, and those points are then redeemable at a gas pump at actually the Shell station around here um, in the Northeast. So I'm getting, you know, I'm getting value on my gas card, and I can use those points in a few other ways as well. So I, I keep talking about currency. Well, how is this currency? So from the digital script perspective, um, digital technology can verify and record earnings. So from the marketer's perspective. Uh, the marketer gets receipts for the labor, facial res recognition, GPS, near field location, shared links trail, you know, any kind of data exhaust says, yes, indeed, this person, you know, did what they said they did. The, on the other hand, the shopper gets an immediate acknowledgement of earnings. Ha ha, I got the points. Great. Um, which brings me to the next point, which is, that digital technology can store and bank value. So earnings in the form of digital script reside online and on mobile. And of course, mobile is very important because you know we're, we're going to be paying with mobile. Um, so that both the shopper and the marketer have access to what is stored and banked. And then finally, um, you know, the value is redeemable across channels, which is terrific. The extent to which the shoppers can use the script to buy goods and services is the extent to which it's really comparable to fiat currency, which is why I keep emphasizing this business about um, the ability to take a lot of these different kinds of um, points and um, push them into a PayPal account. So here's points.com. I've got two videos. This first one is points.com. And you can redeem all kinds of um, really neat points so that they all dump into one. Okay, here we are. Points for great products and services. Start by going to the Give and Redeem section of points.com. Next, choose the product or service you're interested in from our list of featured retailers, or click See All Retailers for the full list. Next, choose the program you would like to redeem points from and the value of the gift card. Then click the Calculate button. Review the amount of points needed to complete your request and click the Confirm Redeem button. Follow the checkout process and complete your redemption. Okay, she was talking about points and gift cards, but you can take all of your points from all of these different kinds of programs here that you can see. I'm scrolling down. And you, if you want to, you can either get gift cards, which are dollars and cents, or, as they're showing here, PayPal. So you can just dump them right into PayPal and use that, of course, to you know buy whatever it is you like. Um, so the next video really shows that if I've got a PayPal account or if I've got some of these kinds of digital script and I want to aggregate them using a points.com kind of a website or clearinghouse, I can uh, now make that really um, frictionless and fungible with my fiat currency, that's dollars and cents, um, using um, a mobile device. So we have Google Wallet, which is you know, now um, becoming a bit prominent. But we also have ISIS. I tend to like ISIS a bit more because I think that they have more partners right now. But wh whoever has the broadest platform will probably be the winner here. And I'm going to show you how this is going to work. So you can imagine that you can take all of these points, aggregate them, and then use them at a digital point of sale, which will be everywhere as soon as, of course, we are using um, digital wallets or you know mobile wallets to pay. So. There's this great video from the South by Southwest con conference where this is being demonstrated. Okay, here we go. Hi, friends. Mayor of We're at South by Southwest 2012. So coming out party for ISIS and NFC payment system. This is Brian. You're going to walk us through the app, and we're going to see it in action. 
Here you go. Come in here. Pin code protects you. All of your credit cards are loaded at the top of the strip, and all of your merchants that you're following or have loyalty cards at or at the bottom of the strip. Activating the card and activating an offer is very simple. You can add as many offers as you want. You notice at the bottom you have two smart tap ready and your loyalty card added. By activating the credit card and tapping, it will cause the transaction to be complete. Uh, we have a nice speed where anybody you're following shows up in speed. Selecting any of them and activating it adds the offer. You can find any of your merchants, issuers, or merchants with loyalty cards filtered through the directory. And you can select them and add them and follow them right there. You have a couple other sections, card list, settings, and help. And uh, but all, all the main functionality here is right here. So uh, this, is an app, this is our actual application. And uh, we're going to make a purchase. Just that. Authorizing. We get a post tap summary screen telling you which card was used, if you passed both cards, and if you passed off if you did not as a vending machine. And then you make your collection here. And it deducts on the card. And the process is done. Great. Very simple, straightforward. There you go. And the Thysis, uh, it works with pretty much every major credit card right now? And uh, we're, we're, right now we're partnering with Chase, uh -huh. uh, Capital One, and Barclays. Okay. And uh, we, we have other partners rolling out. Great. Great. And uh, where can you find out more information? Paywithisis.com. Thank you. Okay, so that was that was the ISIS um, payment, and again, that's so that's to sort of demonstrate that this kind of digital script that will be earned through shopper labor tasks can be increasingly accompanying, either supplementing or supplanting um, fiat currency in many cases um, through um, Google Wallet or, or ISIS. So we've been talking a lot about the value to the shopper and how that's going to work for them. Let's talk about the value to the marketer. How can marketers assess the strategic and financial value of these kinds of behaviors? Um, <clears throat> in, in, the, um, in the book, I have a chapter for valuing each one of these kinds of behaviors. Um, so I'm just going to walk through some of the main ideas here um, today, but you can get much more detail in the book. Um, I'm calling this toward valuing advocacy because I think that um, as we're beginning to look at these different kinds of behaviors, more sophisticated techniques will emerge. But nevertheless, I think that, that advocacy can be valued both in terms of return on investment, dollars and cents, as well as in comparison to public relations efforts. And so what I've done here is taken out a strategic valuation kind of swap, if you will, on the left, where the shopper is saying, I'm giving up my time and my effort and potentially my social standing, talking now about advocacy. And the marketer is buying two things. They're buying new users. There's your ROI to increase the penetration of the marketplace for that brand, um, and also potentially new awareness. So that's in comparison to public relations efforts. So, you know, in terms of performance, we can see that Buddy Media, for example, said the average Facebook share generates over $2 in incremental sales, and the conversion rate for Facebook share was about, uh, was a little over 10%. So, you know, I'm not saying that that's the be-all, end-all, but I am saying that these kinds of metrics will become increasingly um, common. We're going to see them all over the place. And also, in the book, I talk about um, a formula that was come up that the Harvard Business Review people came up with, and it's it's really good at talking about the value of an advocate and so forth. But I'm not sure that we're going to need those kinds of equations. Instead, I think that what we're going to see are dashboards like this one, and this shows this one also happens to be from Buddy Media, but this one happens to show a real time dashboard of shares, reshares, and conversion. That is conversion to sale. You can break it out by product, by user, by geography. Here you can see in Texas and California, you know, there were a lot of shares going on. Um, and you can really look at, ha-ha, okay, how many, you know, conversions did I have? And you can look at your ROI directly and also in real time. Now, let's get this slide to go. Well, the next slide I talk about um, the valuation of commitment. And in terms of valuing commitment, the shopper 
is giving their commitment or their promise to buy on the next round. Um, and what the marketer is buying is a potential or a probable stream of revenue. The performance metrics for that are what they would be for you know, any sort of loyalty program. So for example, PayPal says, it's seven times cheaper to retain existing customers than to acquire new ones. So I think that that's, you know, I think that that's really true. I think that there's been a lot of work in this particular area because loyalty programs have been around for a while. Um, so in order to evaluate um, the commitment exchanges, I think they need to be looked at in light of the lifetime value of the shopper. And of course, when I say lifetime value, that's usually um, some sort of a metric that's set out ahead of time to say, okay, you know, how long is that going to be, five years, ten years, something like that, and what are the average number of purchases? Um, the next valuation would be to value participation. And here the strategic exchange would be um, the time and effort of the shopper, which includes you know, all of their engagement. Uh, but basically what they're giving is time and effort. And what the marketer is buying is consideration and also likelihood of conversion. So how likely are they to converge, uh, to, uh, to buy? In terms of performance metrics, it's, it's, uh, you know, it can be quite high. And they should be compared to traditional shopper programs as well as promotions. So the CEO of Shopkick, Syriac Roding, says, as, as you can imagine, the conversion rate from the fitting room is even higher than simple foot traffic in store. Shopkick can reward shoppers for trying on clothes in the fitting room. And so he's looking at conversion rates are, that are well over 90, even over 95%, once you can get them into the fitting room. So as you can imagine... It's uh, mm -hmm. Sal. The, the, the slides aren't advancing on our end. Are they advancing for you? No. I was wondering if you if you might be able to help me. Sure. Actually, maybe I can try to upload them as a backup. So we're going to take a uh, let's if if you don't mind, let's see if we can take a quick break and try to get these up and running. But uh, Liz, if you want to take a question while I try to yeah, get yeah, sure, correct. absolutely. So again, just to remind the audience, questions can be submitted on Twitter at hashtag Awareness Inc. Um, and uh, they can also be submitted in the WebEx chat. But Liz, I had a question for you. So we've talked a little bit about uh, a couple of the vendors, Shopkick, Shop, uh, excuse me, Shopkick, Checkpoint, uh, WeRewardPoints.com, and then sort of another group like ISIS versus Google Wallet. Do you see the industry shaking out where... Um, where uh, sort of one is going to overtake and become the dominant player, the sort of the way in social media there was kind of a lot of different social networks, and now Facebook is sort of you know king of the hill and probably isn't going anywhere for a while. Do you think that they're going to sort of uh, shake out and there's going to be sort of less of them and more dominant players? I think you're right. I think that there will be um, some do a couple of dominant players, and I think that there will be some niche players. So you're absolutely right, and right now they're sort of duking it out. Um, Shopkick right now is mm, probably the most popular. Um, I have not seen figures on the number of users, which would be, of course, the attractive thing for um, marketers. Um, but the attractive thing for shoppers would be, you know, breadth of retailers and also being able to um, dump everything into a PayPal account or have that be fungible with cash. So right now we're looking at Shopkick as the front runner. Um, it looked like I had actually almost fixed the darn thing. <laughs> of course. Yeah, just um, yeah right. Um, but yes, and so Shopkick I would put as number one right now. I like Scavenger. Um, Scavenger tends to be focused on smaller local businesses, like local retailers. I'm talking about a pizza shop, um, a, a, you know, a beauty salon or hair salon, you know, this kind of thing. Now, the thing that's kind of neat about that is I'm going to predict that one of the things that's going to happen here is something like either maybe not a checkpoint, but something like a scavenger um, may decide to hook up with like a Yelp, which is really hyper local. And I think that those two things can work really well together. And um, of course, each of those has a social component, which I think would mesh really well. But the um, scavenger and, and you know a few like it have you know a very heavy gamification kind of an angle, which would work really well for those local retailers in particular. And I think that um, you know adding the review component is you know just sort of the thing to close the sale in a sense. So I can see you know that some of these might merge as well. Got it, got it. 
Um, yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think that's, to me, that's what's sort of going to be the tipping point is, like you said, you know, it depends on the vendors that are involved in the deals. Once, uh, th I think the audience feels like there's some place that they can go where they can, you know, access the lion's share of what's available, that's when this will sort of really, uh, you know, become the front of mind for everybody. So what I have is I have your slides up and loaded. So right, so value and commitment. Um, this is just about you know looking at the you know the value of what we're giving the shoppers, the wage, so to speak, in exchange for their commitment for future purchasing, um, in comparison with their lifetime value. And the lifetime value you know can be five years, ten years, you know whatever whatever that um, time horizon happens to be. Um, and of course, it's cheaper to retain customers than acquire new ones. So let's go to the next slide. So what I wanted to talk about here is a sidebar on um, valuing advocacy and value and commitment, which is that sometimes the best, not sometimes, I'm thinking that it may be quite often the best brand advocates are not the heaviest buyers. This is interesting. I saw this in an HBR article called The New Way to Value Word of Mouth, and I also heard it from some of the people that I was inter interviewing, the industry experts who were, you know, previewed lots and lots of data. And um, I thought that was just kind of interesting to say, Wow, if you take um, you know quintiles of the heaviest users and you also look at who the heaviest advocates are, so you're saying, okay, these guys are contributing sales and these guys are contributing new users in the forms of their friends, those uh, none of those um, quintiles were overlapping. I think that they were deciles, but never, nevertheless, none of them were overlapping. So that's really interesting to me is to say, haha, if my user, if my heavy advocates are not the same as my heavy users, and I think that sometimes that assumption is made, what it means is that they need to be evaluated differently because the value of a referral is different from a value of a heavy user. Um, I'm speaking financially. And then the other thing is they're probably motivated differently. So the people who are interested in talking a lot about your brand, and maybe not buying so much, maybe they're just average users or even light users, they're motivated differently than the people who are heavy users and who aren't advocating as much. So that says a lot to me about strategy, and it also talks about financial valuation. I think that might be a really interesting point for people to walk away with today. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of value and participation, the person is giving up, the shopper is giving up their time and their effort. And, of course, you know, that has to do with just, um, you know, the hassle factor. You know, is it, is it going to be easy for me or is it going to be a big pain in the neck? Um, so the effectiveness uh, in terms of having the brand be, um, you know, sort of to top of mind consideration like um, evoked set, as well as their likelihood to convert to purchase, um, those can all be compared to traditional promotions and shopper programs. Um, next slide. And then when it comes to valuing attention exchanges, I think these are really just comparable to other kinds of media communications. So for example, with Social Vibe, which I talked about, they're the sort of intel inside kind of strategy behind some of the Zynga um, you know, watch the ad, get the um, in-game cash kind of um, exchanges. They're saying, well, all of our advertisements are consumer initiated. We've got an 80% completion rate and over a minute spent per user. So you can imagine that awareness and consideration might be quite a bit higher among people who saw the ad in this kind of a context than they did on, say, television. Um, so um, anyway, they can be compared in that way. So next slide. Okay, so let's just talk about a couple of the implications, and then we'll open it up for questions. The first is, of course, the shopper is the medium, and you guys know that, but also the shoppers know it. I did this um, fan page scrape, and I did a bunch of blog scrapes, but nevertheless, shoppers are saying stuff like this. If we like you, we should be rewarded. We're advertising for you, so they know it. And they understand that their um, word of mouth is worth something. And here, I thought I'd get a free sample by liking. I liked and nothing on how to get my new coffee. You know, hey, what's up with that? So next slide. So what's the implication of that? Well, shoppers are behaving with these kinds of value exchanges in mind. What is the return on my participation? What am I going to get if I play here? What am I going to get if I advocate here? Is this going to be worth it to me? Um, so I think as marketers, we need to approach shoppers um, understanding the value of these transactions from their point of view. Let's make it worth their while. Um, next slide. 
Number two, thinking beyond barriers to purchase. Now, in shopper marketing, um, shopper marketing considers barriers to purchase. Um, so, for example, can I navigate to it and so forth? Do I know about it? But I think the shopper economy is considering barriers to these kinds of four buckets of behavior. What would prevent me, for example, from paying attention or to participating? And so next slide. And so some of these, for example, could include uh, if, you know, if my labor is undervalued by the employer or the potential seller, um, then it's too much of a hassle. It's not worth it. I mean, I make it worth my while. Also, when it comes to advocacy, there are some social stigma products. So I might buy, for example, something that says, oh, yeah, I've got you know, hemorrhoid cream. I need this. Okay, I might buy it. Am I going to tell everyone in my social graph about that? I don't know. Um, and then finally, when it comes to commitment and loyalty, um, those are real security issues. You have to feel safe opting in. But these are the kinds of barriers where if we can overcome these, a lot of times we'll be able to um, increase our user base. Um, next implication. Thanks. Um, of course, you guys all know that not all shoppers contribute equally. So, for example, Sal's social graph might be quite a bit bigger than mine. Um, and so, therefore, we might want to reward him in a much bigger way than we reward me, um, or vice versa. So, grading and understanding the value of the advocacy for for these different shoppers is going to become increasingly important. But I also think it will become increasingly easy um, with big data. So next slide. Um, here, we've just talked about this. The best advocates may not be the heaviest buyers. Um, so with not all shoppers contributing equally, number one, they're not all made the same. So some people will have either a bigger social net or a more influential one. But also, it depends on are they heavier advocates or are they heavier buyers. If, they, if the shopper is a heavier potential buyer, we might want that person to participate more and spend more to get them to play the game and engage personally. If, on the other hand, uh, you know, they fit the profile of someone who's more likely to be a heavy advocate, we might incent them differently using their social graph. So these are the kinds of um, research questions that I think we'll begin to see emerge. Um, so this is the last slide. We need to think in terms of value transactions because our shoppers are. Barriers to behavior aren't the same as barriers to purchase. We need to think about what might prevent someone from you know, engaging with us when constructing programs. And finally, valuing shoppers and their behavior will become more important and I believe easier as we move forward and are really beginning to mine big data and see those great dashboards beginning to emerge um, so we have real-time ROI and real-time um, valuation of those shoppers. And that is what I have to say today. And thank you so much for uh, advancing those slides, Sal. I really appreciate that. Sure, no problem, no problem. So um, thank you for presenting. Uh, we are going to open up the question portion of our presentation. Again, questions can be submitted in the WebEx chat, or they can be submitted on Twitter at hashtag Awareness Inc. Uh, a couple of follow-up items before we get to those questions, and we do have uh, several that I want uh, uh, several already submitted that I want to get to. But um, again, the Awareness Social Marketing Hub is available via free trial, so you can sign up for that at this at this link. Also, the Shopper Economy uh, for more information on the book or to purchase ShopperEconomy.net. We also have a free chapter download of the Shopper Economy if you want to wet your whistle before you purchase. Uh, if you're ordering from Amazon and you don't want to wait for it to ship, that is available here and you can get started with it. Um, so uh, I thought that was actually very interesting and I think this, you know, it speaks to a lot of the ways in which sort of inter internet marketing is going. It's, it's, it's going to be sort of a, a more complex system of purchases and rewards. Uh, Liz, just for my own question I had was just um, with the Dunkin' Donuts example, um, did they do anything when they were getting that sort of feedback where people were expecting to be rewarded because of their likes? What should they have done if they thought that perhaps, you know, one like isn't worth one free cup of coffee or something like that? You know, uh, where was that from? What were the impl impl implications of, of what you found? Um, you know, I didn't follow up to see, you know, did, did Dunkin' Donuts sort of correct the situation? Um, I just thought it was kind of neat that the shoppers really understood that, that their labor is worth something and they're beginning to expect to be rewarded. Um, but um, in terms of what I think that they should have done, um, yes, 
first, you have to respond to the person who's actually gotten on there, and they're already on their Facebook page. So if it's a fan page, um, I would, I gotta believe that somebody over at Dunkin' Donuts is looking at that fan page, um, and they should probably be looking at it every day, um, and respond directly to that person, and make sure that you know whatever those links are that need to happen, or whatever it is that needs to you know be easy to print out and bring to the store um, to redeem is happening, or download to your you know to your cell phone, or you know whatever the heck it is that needs to happen, it has to be corrected like immediately, because we're all in this real time kind of world where it's like not only always on, but, um, you know, there's this kind of instant gratification kind of thing. So I think that um, speed is of the essence when it comes to dealing with shoppers, um, you know, in the digital world. And we had a question about just, you know, incorporating the traditional social media into this new economy, and that's, you know, that's a, probably the simplest example I can think of is, you know, providing some good or service in exchange for a like. Um, is there any sort of, uh, you know, other good examples that you're seeing of just, you know, basic social media, you know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, being incorporated into these programs? Um, well, sometimes there's, like, you know, sometimes there's sort of these plus-up things. So, for example, um, and Scavenger, and also, you know, for the people who are listening, check Scavenger out. It's really neat. Um, and also, like with my book, you can download it. And if you download it um, using Kindle, all of the links in the book are actually live links. They should work. Um, some of the people I've talked to, they said it works. So in other words, like when I refer to it, if you're on like a Kindle or something like that, or an e-book format, you can click on it and you'll see what I mean. Um, but even if you don't get it, just go on there and check it out. So here's what I mean. So like, for example, if it says, well, I can earn so many points if I go over to you know that store and and play this kind of game or do something. Okay, that's good. Then I can plus up and get more points if I then tweet that. And um, I thought that there was a really neat one by Tasty Delight, which is um, sort of a you know low fat kind of ice cream kind of a product. It's you know it's here in the Northeast. Anyway, what was really cool about it was um, if you have a frequent buyer account. You know, I think even Pinkberry has one of these, but they use a little, they use like a little cardboard card that you put in your wallet. But, um, Tasty Delight said, link your Twitter account to your, um, Tasty Delight account. And they give you like a, like a little Tasty Delight card. And when they swipe it, it tells all of your followers that you've just bought, you know, a Tasty Delight cup or cone. And every time you do that, not only do you put up more points to get a cup or cone faster, but um, by telling everybody in your social graph, you actually you know plus up and get more points. So I thought this was really neat and also kind of built into the system. So you didn't actually have to rely on the shopper in order to take that action. So that was kind of neat. Um, I think we're going to see more of these kinds of things that work um, in conjunction. So it's both participation and advocacy working hand in hand. Interesting, interesting. Uh, speaking of participation, so they do they do have sort of a, or someone did submit a question of just, is there a way to encourage true engagement as opposed to just, uh, you know, participation for, you know, the sake of the reward? You know, or is there a way to, you know, differentiate that, uh, you know, even among your participants who's right. actually participating? Right, 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 right. You know, I've been getting this question um, quite a bit, and you're absolutely right. Um, the way I heard this phrase, another way I heard this phrase was, well, aren't you just creating loyalty to, you know, you know, to whatever the, whatever the little thing is and, you know, to the, to the reward and not to the brand? Well, let me say this. I think that some of these platforms are just that. They're just mechanisms by which you can, we can interact with shoppers differently and recruit people to play with our brand who might not have been recruited to play with our brand and have, get up close and personal with People who are maybe a bit new or will play with a brand in a different kind of level, either playing a game or talking to their friends or you know interacting differently. I think that um, it's true that some people will be working just for the rewards, and I think there will be a lot of that. But I also think in the meantime, we're going to make a lot of sales. And that's neat. And those are sales. some of those sales, and even many of them, might not have happened anyway. might not have happened otherwise. So, um, because one thing that's true is that if we don't play, our competitors will, and they'll get those sales. So I think it's kind of like a, you know, a choice of no choice, <laughs> in a way. Now, sometimes, 
like in one part of the book, I talk about, well, what are all the different currencies that the shopper has in his pocket? And what are all of the different currencies that the seller has in his pocket? And it's not just fiat currency and, say, digital script and labor, but also there's other kinds of softer rewards that people are looking for, too. Information, education, entertainment, um, access, um, social standing. There's all kinds of things that people will work for that may hit directly into, you know, with the brand equity. Um, for example, like there's a program called Softness Worth Sharing, which was part of the Kleenex brand. So, in other words, you know, I could say, oh, Sal, I know that, you know, you know, maybe maybe your canary died, and so I'm going to send you, it's free to me, um, a little box of Kleenex. And I can put my own little personalized message, you know, dear Sal, so sorry for your loss, um, sincerely Liz, and you would get that free sample of Kleenex. Now, I may al- it may also convert you, and then I get a free sample too. So there's ways like that that um, I'm not actually getting digital script and instead, what I'm getting are rewards that are more directly um, paying off the emotional benefit, you know, namely comfort, um, with, the, with the product, namely Kleenex. So in other words, you're going to see some of that, and that's great, but I think that as a practical matter, a lot of brands are going to have to participate in this kind of like script for behavior kinds of um, transactions, even if you've got some, you know, hit it out of the park kind of other stuff like that softness we're sharing program. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so, again, questions can be submitted via the WebEx chat, and they can also be submitted on Twitter at hashtag Awareness Inc. We have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to try to get to a few more of these. Um, one question that came in, Liz, was uh, the dashboard that you mentioned. Is that something that you created, or is that something that, you know, where did you get that? Where is that available? Okay, that is um, pretty nifty stuff here. Um, that <laughs> is at, conv- that's Buddy Media. And um, Buddy Media is offering that, and they call that their conversion uh, buddy. So you can go right directly to their website and check it out. And this is just dummy data, but it's just to show what it can do. And I think that they do a good job, but as a practical matter, I think we're going to be seeing more and more of these kinds of dashboards that are going to report um, you know, sharing, resharing, and conversion along a certain, you know, along the chain. So in other words, you can maybe record, you know, three levels of share and three levels of conversion. That's fantastic. I think we're going to even go further than that. Um, and we're going to get more sophisticated. And this will become, you know, today's newfangled thing becomes, you know, tomorrow, you know, yet tomorrow's toaster. I mean, in other words, the whole thing just becomes so blasé after a while because we get so used to it. Uh, but right now, it's really sexy stuff because we haven't had access to that kind of data and it hasn't been organized that way. But right, but that particular one that came from Buddy Media. Got it. Got it. Um, so a couple more minutes. Let's try to get as many more questions in as we can. So let me check what we have in the queue. Um, so we did have one here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, how can a company continually meet expectations when you're providing these rewards and scripts? Hmm. Can, you, can you repeat that? Sure, sorry. Uh, how can a company continue to meet expectations when they are providing these rewards and scripts? I guess, I mean, what I take that question to mean is if you're always providing something, like we're giving, we're giving something away in, in, uh, in exchange for participation and behavior, um, how can that stay fresh? How can you stay, uh, you know, stay meeting the, the customer's expectations when now they know that they're sort of receiving something in, turn, in reward for their behavior and now they have a different set of expectations for their behavior? Oh, yeah. Well, it's true. You know, we're all going to be, you know, everybody's going to be hooked with a needle in their arm on this, you know. And so some marketers are going to say, well, I'm not going to reward people like this. Because I've already heard this, you know, some, from some various people in the industry. Like, you know, this just increases our cost of doing business. Uh, however, because, well, now we've got to reward them, and then plus we have to sell them something, and, you know, what happens to our margins, and you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I think that, I think that as a practical matter, that the, the labor and the budgets for marketing are shifting directly onto the shopper. So I think we're going to be spending less in terms of, you know, broad reach, try to talk to everybody kind of advertising, and more on 
rewarding shoppers for playing with us directly or engaging with us directly. In terms of meeting expectations, of course, this will continue to lie with, um, you know, our creative minds and, um, you know, with people who are sharp marketers. Um, but I think it's going to ma- make a more interesting game for savvy marketers, um, and we're just going to see a budget budgetary shift. So, thank you. All right, so I think we're we're just about out of time. I want to thank everybody for attending. I obviously want to thank our presenter Liz Crawford uh, for being here with us today. I want to remind everybody that you will be receiving a copy of this recording, so we're, we're uh, you'll receive a link. To, uh, to a page that has the, the video and audio of this recording. You should be receiving that tomorrow unless you run into any sort of problems. But, um, but Liz, thank you so much. I learned a lot. Uh, I think everybody needs to be thinking uh, in terms of this uh, sort of new, new economy when they're, were, when they're conducting their marketing. And um, good luck to everybody in your marketing. Thank you.